Chris, good to see you. So how likely is it for this uh, truce to lead to a permanent ceasefire? That should be the determined ambition. It should be the ambition of the international community that so far have been very weak throughout the entirety of the 47 days of this chapter of this conflict. This truce should be the window where energetic diplomacy kicks into action in order to make sure that we don't get back to the massive carnage and bombardment of Palestinians in Gaza. We don't want to see those hellish scenes ever again. And this little window can be that moment where we can try to look for confidence building measures, the sorts of measures that both Israeli leaderships and uh, Palestinian leaderships can, can live with in order to bring about a very different future to Gaza. Now, it must also go beyond just being a ceasefire. We have now got an agreement for a truce. Uh, there could be an agreement for a ceasefire, which would imply a much longer term arrangement. But even then, we mustn't leave it there because that's been the failing of every other of the five or six wars this century on Gaza. It's been the failing to really tackle the underlying issues. You cannot have a situation at the end of this where Gaza is not free, where Palestinians in Gaza can't trade, travel freely, where they can't fish freely, where they can't have a normal life that all of us expect for our loved ones, for our children. If they don't do that, if Gaza is not rid of an occupation and a blockade that has afflicted them within it, then the international community would have failed once again. So this should be the early kicking off point to get to that situation. Chris, what happens when Israel is able to get its captives released from Hamas once this four day truce period is over and we don't see a permanent ceasefire? Are you concerned that Israeli attacks on Gaza will be reinforced? It is quite possible because there's many in the Israeli cabinet who want to see that. Of course, there are three members of the cabinet who voted against this deal from the really extreme far right parties. But I think that we can also try to make this truce have a momentum of its own, that when Israelis see 50 of their loved ones being released, and they know, of course, that there are others that are still being held in, in Gaza, that there could be further releases, that that might actually increase the demand for a further deal. Also, on the Palestinian side, there will be no desire to get back to that really horrific uh, Armageddon-style bombing that they've had to endure, that they will see, hopefully, an increase in the amount of aid and fuel, crucially, into the Gaza Strip. And they, too, will not wish to go back. So we need to get things moving right now so we don't have to make a reverse step and experience the sort of hell that we've seen on our screens ever again. And that means that senior international statesmen, such as they are, really have to be working overtime now. The phones have to be permanently going, working day and night to maximize this little window of opportunity. Chris, it was Qatar and the United States which played a crucial role when it comes to this truce agreement. What is your navigation through the type of leadership and diplomacy both the US and Qatar have exhibited? Well, well done them. I think that they could have done with more support internationally. I think the United States uh, actually carries a huge amount of responsibility here, given the weakness of its positions. And it has, after all, been sending aid with one hand and sending bombs to Israel with the other. So I think there is a huge amount of anger against the United States. So they've got a lot of ground to catch up. But they could start to do that by pressuring Israel to come to its senses, frankly, that it cannot win this militarily. There is no military solution short of genocide and ethnic cleansing, which nobody should want. And that they can actually achieve some of their legitimate aims through a uh, political process. And I think that's really the only way forward. Chris, to what extent do you think the domestic dynamics within the United States are influencing, US, US, influencing US's policy towards Israel? 
well, foreign policy is domestic politics, really, isn't it? And we see a lot of criticism within the Democrat Party about the way in which President Biden has handled all of this. There is deep divisions and anger about it all. And I think that going into an election year, I mean, the American elections are just one year away. If President Biden wishes to have a serious chance of re-election, he's got to start to be a lot more convincing than he has been hitherto. That said, I think that there are signs of acute tension between the Biden administration and the Israeli government. I think there is a lot of anger about the performance, particularly of the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. They don't trust him. They don't believe that he's been honest. And of course, that's actually reflected in the opinion polls within Israel, where there is you know, barely any support, any trust in Netanyahu. And I think that most people have agreed that really when the, the guns do fall silent, that he will no longer be Israeli prime minister. And there are many people waiting up, waiting to, to kick him out. But we need not just Qatar and the United States to be active in this. We need all the regional actors, including Egypt, maybe Turkey, uh, all, all those countries who can bring some influence to bear. They need to be really pressing their foot down to get to a permanent ceasefire with a political track to resolve the underlying issues. Chris Doyle, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for talking to us here on TRT World.